So we have Sarah Gayton. Hello, Sarah. Hi. And Catherine Hinch. Hinchy. Thank you, Sarah. Hello. Good to see you Hi. again. Graham. Uh, Graham, Hello. good to see you again. We, 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 I first came across you when you gave evidence to the Transport Select Committee. And um, Dudley from Brussels, Dudley Curtis, I hope will be um, joining us. And uh, here he is. So Dudley, good to see you too. Um, yeah, so Sarah is an uh, activist, campaigner, and um, incredible source of information to us. We could not have done this project without the um, reports that Sarah has pointed pointed point, pointed out to us, passed on to us from social media, cases from social media. In many ways, you were the inspiration for this. We thought, right, if you can find all these, all these cases on social media, uh, let's put them together. So thank you ever so much for that. And, and you work with um, the National Federation uh, uh, for the blind, uh, of the blind, sorry, UK, don't you? Um, Catherine, uh, Waitman's also have contributed hugely to this, and, 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 and you, you know, you and your colleagues ran fantastic uh, webinars on this um, about a year ago. I think you, about, you had so many people, 350 people, and then you had to run a second one, you know. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was amazed how the insurance companies, like authorities, solicitors, all sorts of stuff were, you know, people who, whose probably hourly rate is quite high <laughs> joined into that. So congratulations to you. Um, Graham, you um, at Salford University, uh, ha, you know, have been look, uh, looking into the broader issues of sustainability, um, active travel, and so forth. And uh, you've recently published your own study on the experience of e-scooters on the Salford campus. Um, and Dudley, well, you know, you cover the rest of the world, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're waiting very much to hear from uh, you know from ETSC. And of course, the ETSC members, of which PAX is a founder member, um, we'll be hearing from Margaret this afternoon um, on this on this very topic. So it's it's of widespread interest, and in, and you are gathering information from across Europe on legislation and so forth. So yeah, we're just we're just a little bit in that bigger piece. Um, so actually, Dudley, could I could I could I start with you then, please, and just just say, I mean, some people say, well, you know, the UK late to the party, you're just catching up with the rest of uh, you know the rest of Europe. Um, in some ways, true, but you know, how how do you see it? I mean, are we just are we just late, and we should just get with it and adopt what's happening elsewhere in Europe? Well, I think in terms of um, private e-scooters, yes, the UK is um, late. I mean, there's one um, model I've been thinking about quite a lot, which is what they've done in Denmark, which is where they uh, legalised private e-scooters. Uh, nationally, but they only legalize them as a trial. So it's a national trial, which is for three years. And um, I mean, I'm not really sure if this would apply in the UK too, but the this has actually given them some legal flexibility to quite quickly change the rules as they go along, um, you know, as new knowledge has come available. So one of the things they've done recently is uh, just from 1st of January, they've introduced mandatory helmets for the e-scooters based on you know the uh, the research that's been done by the government looking at injury levels and so on and i think there's a piece of danish research that showed that uh, the the risks of, of an injury were seven times higher than for for bikes so they've taken that you know new knowledge on board and they're adapting their legislation and i think that's a that's a good model um here in belgium where i am here in brussels um the government's just announced that they're going to make a few tweaks to the rules as well. Um, they had not previously banned having a passenger on an e-scooter. And just, you know, when I walk around the streets of Brussels, you see this quite often on private and hire scooters that you see people carrying a passenger. That was not illegal up till now. That is going to be illegal when the law changes in a few months. And they've also looked at this question of riding e-scooters on pavements. So in Belgium, you, you could ride an e-scooter on a pavement up to six kilometers an hour. Uh, that was that's the current rule. Um, and what they found is that's basically unenforceable. Um, I think practically it's actually quite difficult um, to ride an e-scooter at that low speed. We talked about balance, also the very small throttle you have. They tend to they tend to want to go at their full speed, especially the, the private ones. So they've given up on that. And I think that that also speaks to what we were talking about earlier on in the in the seminar about how we've been thinking about these things as bikes. And in some countries, Belgium included, you can ride a bike on the pavement uh, as a child. Up to the age of 12, you can ride a bike on a pavement here. And I, for example, am allowed as an adult to accompany my children on their bikes on the pavement. Uh, 
And I think if you see e-scooters like that, it's kind of natural that you would also allow them on on the pavement possibly, but they're, they're seeing that clearly this is not working in practice. And so they're getting rid of that. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna see that increasingly around Europe, that kind of change and also more changes looking at speeds, looking at helmets um, and, and some of these rules about where you can ride them and so on. Well, that's interesting. And the idea of a, a three month experiment with private e-scooters. Three like, years. Three years, sorry. Yeah, sorry, three years indeed. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's one we hadn't thought about. Fascinating. Um, Catherine, we talked about legislation there. Um, I mean, you're, you're a specialist in catastrophic injury claims, I believe. And yes. uh, how is it, how is it um, from where you sit? Well, yes, I advise insurers in relation to catastrophic injury claims, and we are seeing um, now cases, civil cases um, coming in, which are um, arising out of the result of injuries that have been sustained uh, in accidents with e-scooters. Um, and we're seeing um, they're now starting to come through. Obviously, there's a, there's a time lag between those accidents happening and then them filtering through. Um, and we're seeing both um, accidents involving rental schemes, <coughs> excuse me, and accidents involving private e-scooters. And I think we're expecting that to really continue to increase as the popularity increases. Um, we're expecting, obviously, the, there to be more accidents and what's sort of particularly of note is that um, greater accident severity as well. We've talked a bit today about uh, head injuries and uh, the incidences and we're seeing that as well. So obviously from an insurer perspective, head injuries um, are some of the most expensive uh, civil claims. So that's obviously a, a concern um, around that. And obviously the, the more of those you have, obviously the more expensive expensive it is and there's obviously issues around and um, the private e-scooters when we're seeing those cases um you know obviously they're not uh, insured um at the moment and that's really one of the the key issues i'm sure we'll come on to really is is what what's going to happen in terms of the the classification of e-scooters and the impact that that has on the insurance position obviously at the moment they're classified as as motor vehicles which means that um, insurance uh, is compulsory and obviously that's not possible for, for private e-scooters at the moment so um, they're illegal to be used but um, we're seeing obviously cases going to um, the Motor Insurers Bureau to deal with because those riders are essentially uninsured if they're causing injuries to other, other people, pedestrians, other road users and that's really one of the, the key issues going forward or what will happen with that, will it remain to be classified as a motor vehicle um, which would, under the current legal framework, attract compulsory insurance, or will the government choose to move away from that and either set up a new category or categorise them in line with e-bikes? And that then leaves open the position of well, what happens then for, for victims of um, collisions with, with e-scooters. And it's really a, a policy question as to um, whether and how those victims will be compensated and who should actually bear the, the financial burden of that. So that's a really, really uh, important issue and obviously one that we just don't have answers to at the moment. Catherine, thank you. Um, yes, the, the issue, I think in the in the data which PAX collected last year, 20% of, of casualties were not the riders. They were predominantly pedestrians, three quarters of those were pedestrians. Um, Sarah, can I, can I bring you in? Because, you know, the issue, issue of yeah, intimidation, <laughs> casualties and so forth to pedestrians uh, and you represent, you know, blind or visually and, and visually impaired pedestrians. Um, what, what, what are you hearing on this and uh, observing? Well, I've actually been to quite a lot of the trial cities and towns that are, have got the e-scooters. I mean, personally, it's, it's an absolute nightmare. I mean, pedestrians have been literally terrorised because both the rental and illegal e-scooters are riding all over the pavements and they're also riding over control crossings. So they're riding at people, expecting people to jump out of the way. But our members that are blind or visually impaired can't do that. So it's absolutely horrendous what is, is going out on the street. Um, and if we if these do become legalised, the safety in the sanctuary of that pavement will disappear. We know there's already problems with other uh, forms of mobility, but the these e-scooters can infiltrate every single part of the urban environment that a pedestrian could. You know, it's 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 really really scary. Um, 
you know, and with the rental ones, you've got the, the extra trip hazard. You know, they're still being left on pavements. They're still being parked on pavements. And we see lots of riders riding around racks that have been put out, again, intimidating pedestrians, having e-scooters left all around the rack. So the solutions being put forward are simply not working. And I think we really, we really have to understand the pavements also have become quite a lot of them have become shared use. So if a cyclist can use it, an e-scooter user can use it. And that in Bristol is a complete nightmare. You know, whoever allowed this to happen, the trial ones, is, you know, didn't understand what they were doing. They didn't un understand unleashing this serious impact on pedestrians. And and really the trial should be shut down. The the actual fundamental data that is needed to evaluate the safety of these e-scooters has not been collected. It isn't being collected, or hasn't been collected systematically by the police. Why, you say, why do you say that, Sarah? You because know, the hospital because... data, because the hospital data, I've been putting freedom of information on quite a number, and they keep coming back, is that we haven't got e-scooter on our records, on our, on our data. So that, that data is not coming through. It's piecemeal. You've got some very good evidence ones. And I think what today's report has shown, or, or this seminar, is that there is these massive hotspots where the rental e-scooter trials have gone in. And that should be a wake up call for everybody listening here to really look at that data that's come out and the impact on the hospitals um, and and just think how how it's impacted that those cities. So, you know, I think it's time to shut the trials down because the data is not really there. Wow. Comprehensive data is not there. No. The, 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 what should really happen as well that the, the report didn't pick up on is the government should stop the sale of these e-scooters because even if they are legalised, the ones on sale are not meeting or won't meet any well, future recommendations. Quite a lot of people have said, you know, that it's ridiculous allowing sales <laughs> of, but, you know, almost any any speeding capacity and then, and then make and then saying, by the way, it's all illegal. But I'm just um, wondering, we, well, I'd like to bring Graham in here um, because when the government uh, gave the green light to the trials, it, it, you know, the, the, they were already thinking about it, but the, the coronavirus pandemic um, was the impetus. And um, but it was very much part of the government's decarbonisation of transport strategy, which is, which is absolutely an important agenda and one which PACT very much supports. Um, do you see them as, you know, contributing valuably to that to that agenda, and, and does that maybe uh, out, you know, outweigh the, the 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 risks and so forth? Mm, yeah, I mean, that's I guess that's the fundamental question, isn't it? Really, what what impact is this having on our kind of on our goals in a biggest in a in a wider sense? Um, so our our study has been looking at uh, Greater Manchester, focused around but not limited to the Lyme scheme that we have, which is in Salford and Rochdale. So kind of it's in a, a, a small amount of Greater Manchester but we're looking at kind of Greater Manchester residents as a whole and we've been doing some qualitative and quantitative research um, and yeah we've tried to place this within the kind of within the wider sustainability agenda and I think I think there's a lot a lot a broad consensus now around moving towards um, more shared use transport, more active transport, more electrically powered transport, even better to have more human powered transport, but where it is powered, move to electric rather than uh, petrol. Um, so I see these as part of that transition. I think I think we don't have to imagine that, you know, that, that e-scooters are going to be everywhere, that all journeys are made by e-scooters. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about e-scooters being part of that transition and part of the package of options that pe people will have available to them um, and I think the shared element is actually really important so when we've been speaking to people they've been saying well actually it's really useful because I can now use an e-scooter a, a higher e-scooter shared e-scooter sorry where I might previously have to wait for a long time at a bus stop so I actually feel safer like you know I feel less at risk of, of attack or harassment uh, because I can I can avoid waiting the bus stop. That's not necessarily about e-scooters. That's more about having a, a a means of shared transport available. So that could be an e-bike, a bike, or an e-scooter. So I think if we if we look at it in this light, these are kind of part of that part of that package. Um, however, the concerns around safety and the concerns about the impact on uh, other road users and pavement users is really important. And the, the worst case scenario in in all respects really is that e-scooters put people off. Uh, from walking and cycling, they make it, they make them feel that it's it's actually unsafe to walk and cycle because of of the way they perceive the, the risk from e-scooters. And we have had through our surveys, we have found that people are concerned about that. 
uh, and we have found that it's um, there's a there's a tend towards that bit a trend towards that being older and uh, older respondents to our surveys and and female respondents are also more likely to express those concerns. So we do have to think about the inclusion and the way that e-scooters might impact on other road users. So I, I mean that the the the, the implication of that is that we need really strong enforcement um, in terms of the standards of the e-scooters and then where they're, where they're ridden. And uh, just one more point, I noticed in the chat that someone pointed out that at the moment, because e-scooters are illegal, we, a private owned e-scooter is illegal, we don't really, well, we haven't been investing uh, money in, for example, communication about you shouldn't be riding on the pavement because we, because they're not, because they're not legal, we can't do that. And also because they're illegal, the people who are using them are people who are willing to do to, to use illegal modes of transport or don't know. So if we move to a system where they were legal, but there was much more enforcement, and I mean much more enforcement, we have to think about the resources needed for that, then we might find that, that the situation is better. But I know I, I completely take on board service concerns and, and they really you know call for serious consideration of of of, of, of how we ensure that that, uh, that they don't um, you know impact on other road users. We've got just five minutes or less than five minutes left. Um, I think, Sarah, you've made your position pretty clear on, on what you want or don't want to happen. <laughs> Can I sort of turn to Catherine and, and back to Graham and, and possibly uh, Dudley as well? You know, the government's, I, I think the government is in a bit of a quandary at the moment. I think they've realised it's it's not as easy as they thought it might be. Um, and they've extended the trials and they haven't published them on the so-called um, monitoring report, the interim one at all. And uh, anyway, so we, we've called them to at least publish the data uh, and then we can have a bit more discussion. But Catherine, I mean, what, you know, what, if you're advising Grant Shapps, <laughs> what, do you, what would you what would you go for? <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're, you're right, David, that I think it is very uncertain at the moment. And there's obviously lots of different uh, viewpoints and lots of competing interests that the government will need to, to weigh up really when deciding how to take this forward. It does seem that, you know, to a certain extent, obviously the sheer number of private e-scooters that we've got on the roads at the moment, that's almost taken over and, you know, we're playing catch up really to try to claw some of that back and, and to regulate them. And I think even amongst, I mean, that the Transport Committee's report when uh, they reported back in 2020, there was, you know, real um, mixed views as to some of the key issues like a minimum age, driving licence requirement, insurance again. Um, and that was sort of going down the road of perhaps um, looking at regulating them on e-bikes. But obviously the, the data that's sort of come out since then is certainly what we know from, from Europe that um, whilst it may have started in that way, they're now starting to move away from that. So I, I wonder whether uh, the, um, you know, the data will pers persuade them to move closer, for example, on the insurance position to there being some form of insurance. I think, you know, that that is really important, but it's very difficult because there's so many different parties that have got different interests. And, you know, there's issues of the local authorities, infrastructure, obviously the police, um, various stakeholders that they've got to try and weigh up those things. And it, and it really isn't an easy, an okay. easy uh, question to answer. All right, I'm going to do like on question time, you know, sort of one minute each for your final. So, Graham, how, how would you advise Grant Shapps? Um, I think I, I quite like this idea of a, a three year trial of private um, owned scooters, I suppose, because I don't think we've really properly trialed them. I don't think I think we've 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 trialed rental scooters to an extent, but that's still to an extent because if you have quite a small area where they operate, th their use is quite limited. If you can't go you know, in Greater Manchester, people work all over Greater Manchester and live all over Greater Manchester. If you just have a trial in a small area, um, what's what's that going to tell you about how they're going to use it? Um, okay, so I think, no, that's a good point. Yeah. And here in London, of course, they're in bits of London and yeah. regulations about going between boroughs and so forth. Yeah. Um, Sarah, come on, just just one minute. How, how what's, um, what's your message to Grant Shapps? I think you've been speaking to him directly, haven't you, or at least to other ministers? Yeah, well, actually, what was shocking right when we met the Minister for Transport is she didn't even know the, the data from Bristol from your report. But I tell Grant, look, let's get real. Stop the shops selling them. Let's stop this carnage that's happening out there on the street and bring sanity back down to the pavement level. Um, to let's shut the stop this down. carnage on the streets. Yeah, I'm speaking. Thank you. Um, let's. We know there's already problems out there. Why add to it at this time? I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. Shut the trials down. He hasn't been collecting the correct data for the analysis. 
So what is the point carrying on on them? And actually invest in public okay, transport. OK, OK, that's that's pretty clear. I think, uh, you know, <laughs> I just want to give Dudley a, a quick quick word. And then I'm going to hand to Margaret just to, to sum up as she's done so much of this work. Dudley, any, is there a way forward as a commonality across Europe? Which, which Britain will be part of. <laughs> I mean, no, I think, you know, there is starting to be commonality now on things like speeds, uh, on things like helmet use, where they can be used and so on. But I think one of the things we've got to remember is we, we've talked a lot about the, the technical particularities of, of e-scooters, if you like, and and so on. There's been quite a bit of focus on, on the vehicles themselves. And we're also having conversation with the European Commission now about uh, potential safety standards for e-scooters. But I think what we mustn't, Sort of forget in this debate is how you know these scooters have come along and our cities and our urban environment is just not ready for them still you know we do not have separated cycle infrastructure that we need uh, in most countries in europe with the exception of the netherlands and, and denmark which are excellent but you know the uk i think is far from having uh, the kind of infrastructure that you need in urban areas that would support not only cycling and pedestrian but i think also these new forms of of micro mobility. Thank you ever so much, uh, you know, Sarah, Catherine, Graham, Dudley. Um, again, we'd like to continue, but I'm afraid we must call a draw, call it um, to a halt. We said so we'd finish at half past. So thank you ever so much. And I would like to just hand back to Margaret, who's done so much work on this.